Welcome to the second of two polyurethane lectures for thermoset resins. We will talk about uh, free isocyanate, we'll talk about the additional polyurethane systems, properties, and then applications of polyurethanes. So um, the percentage of free isocyanate in adducting is, if you're going to create adducts, this is something that helps you understand why choose an adduct over a small molecule. After all, don't you want a whole bunch of isocyanate groups present? I mean, wouldn't that be good? Um, isocyanates are toxic, and all every isocyanate group that's available uh, that hasn't been reacted in a productive way has the ability to uh, react in a destructive way or a detrimental way. So um, you can calculate, you can create a uh, MDI, dipropylene glycol adduct, you can grow molecular weight, and it reduces the amount of free isocyanate in the adduct. Now, some of the isocyanate has been reacted to advance molecular weight, so you do still have growth of molecular weight, it just hasn't participated in cross-linking. So in the case of just MDI, small molecule MDI, you have about 33.6% free NCO. When you react uh, two moles of MDI with one mole of dipropylene glycol, you reduce that by over half. And that also reduces the sensitivity to moisture. And that can be, and of course, the sensitivity to moisture can be a problem. So that's why adducting is often done. And it also reduces the toxicity. There are fewer NCO groups to react with your mucous membranes and other things that you don't want them to react with. So it's useful uh, for the same reasons we discussed doing adducts previously. Um, it can reduce toxicity and give you better control over the reaction. So if you have the ratios of a pre-polymer content, it can be varied to achieve various cure times. So if you have a 3 to 2 MDI to dipropylene ratio, you also you further reduce the free NCO. So um, again, you can really tailor your cure conditions and your systems based on uh, your pre-polymer. So moving on now to uh, the other systems we talked about. So we talked about one shot, we talked about two shot, and I'm going to talk about the other types of systems. So this one is a moisture cured system. Uh, this is where you prepare the polyurethane with an iso isocyanate index greater than one, and therefore you have lots of excess isocyanate at the end of the reaction. And then you take that adduct and you dissolve it into a suitable solvent, so like a lacquer, something for coatings, adhesives, or paint. And then what you end up getting, you apply that to your surface. This is usually, say, like if you're going to apply a polyurethane coating to a piece of furniture. You apply that to a piece of furniture, and your isocyanate reacts with atmospheric moisture to give off carbon dioxide bubbles and form ureas in the form of cross-linked compounds. Now, didn't I say these were bad? Well, yes, but if you apply a very thin coating, that, carbon, that CO2 can evolve through the coating and up to the surface. If you go it really, really thick, you'll see bubbles. But if you put on nice, thin coats, like if you want, if you want um, say, a 10 micron coating, well, you want to put on, uh, this is an exaggeration, but five 2 micron coatings. So you let the first one cure, you reapply the next one so that carbon dioxide can evolve and get out of there. Um, ca castor oil is often used as a solvent, and then some hydrochlorofluoromethane is also used as a solvent in these systems. If you're doing this with a, uh, if you're doing a moisture cure system that comes from in a consumer type of formulation, uh, these are almost always not water cleanup; they are uh, solvent cleanup. The next one is a blocked isocyanate system. So this is a diisocyanate and a polyol to form an adduct prepolymer in a closed system and your pre-polymer adduct is blocked by reacting it with some sort of blocking agent in that closed system as well. And so what you end up with is a pre-polymer adduct phenol intermediate, and that is stable, so it won't react with anything, up to 150 Celsius. You heat it up to 150 Celsius, and then your phenol evaporates. And then the pre-polymer adducts cross-link and the longer chains, and then it starts to set and cross-link and become your thermoset. Uh, you have to be careful because phenol is volatile. Uh, you have to exhaust it and get it out of there safely. Uh, this is often used in the application of coating of electrical wires and parts. There are indeed water-based polyurethane systems. Um, these are aqueous polymer dispersions that are the product of emulsion polymerization. You have a pre-polymer that's dispersed in water for coatings and films, and the isocyanate index is often more than two, so lots and lots and lots of extra isocyanate. Um, typically, the polyurethanes are an opaque white, and after the water evaporates, it becomes transparent. Um, so if you ever have a water-based polyurethane, this is what you're dealing with. So if you're coating, uh, you're, if you're coating a piece of furniture, this is, and if it's cloudy, this is typically what you're dealing with. Um, not to be confused with polyacrylic, it also can come out cloudy, but these are typically very white. Polyacrylic is kind of a little cloudy. 
Uh, the advantages of water-based polyurethanes include low or no VOC systems, in other words, no volatile organic compounds, and low room temperature cure. The disadvantages include um, it's not a very efficient cure system. Uh, if, it's if it's a low temperature, it's high humidity, the cure system is even less efficient um, because you have to evaporate water for them to cure properly. So if it's, you know, 40 degrees and 65, 80% humidity, it's going to take longer to cure. It's going to be tacky. So um, you have to kind of keep those things in mind. So now we are going to talk about properties of polyurethanes. Uh, polyurethanes exist as a wide variety of things. Foams, elastomers, paints, coatings, adhesives, fibers. In general, polyurethanes have high flexibility at low temperatures, they have high impact strength, and they have good tear strength. That's why they are engineering thermosets. They have superior properties. Good heat resistance. They are good heat insulators. That's why we use them for foams good resistance to oils, grease, ozone, and they have the ability to be compounded into tough, scuff-resistant materials. So that's why you would coat your floor with a polyurethane coating. They're tough, they're scuff-resistant, they're wear-resistant, they still look good after, well, I'm looking at my floor right now, 152 years. So um, they are superior materials for both coatings and foams because they are tough and scuff-resistant. They have excellent resistance to oxidation and UV light. Uh, they don't generally discolor like epoxies do. Um, they, the elastomers themselves are often have poor resistance to hydrolytic agents like acid or steam or high temperatures um, or chlorinated hydrocarbons. So if you have a pure polyurethane elastomer, they tend to really swell up in organic solvents. Uh, for a polyurethane foam, uh, we're talking about either polyether-based or polyester-based. Typically, flexible foams are polyether-based, and rigid foams are polyester-based, but not always. Um, I've made rigid foams that are polyether-based. Uh, foam densities vary widely. Um, so for a flexible foam, it's usually two pounds per cubic foot. Um, and tensile strength also does vary. Flexible foams tend to be a little weaker, uh, while rigid foams to be a little stronger. Now, a flexible foam is flexible, whereas a rigid foam is rigid. So you give up the strength, but you get the flexibility. Uh, and in the rigid foam, you give up the flexibility. These tend to be very friable. Rigid foams are very friable, meaning that they uh, break apart. They're brittle. Uh, some flexible foams have a higher tear strength than natural rubber. Uh, and the foams have resistance to rot, vermin, and other organic solvents. They have really good acoustic insulating properties and very good radar, radio, and x-ray transmission properties. So um, beams that you want to get through get through, but heat or noise don't. So that's what you want in an insulator, right? When you're talking about polyurethane coatings, uh, these have a lot of polar groups, and so they have excellent adhesiveness to many surfaces, including rubber and leather. They can be made with high gloss and very, very good abrasion resistance, good weather resistance, good electrical resistance in the case of something you're insulating, um, low gas permeability, good chemical resistance, very low shrinkage on cure, and polyurethane coatings are generally better than UP alkyds, but are more expensive. So you can get similar uh, um, uh, results from a UP alkyd, so again, not the whole resin, but just the polyester that you get from the alkyd, but um, uh, PU coatings are more expensive than that. So application areas, we've stated these already, but we will go over them again. Uh, approximately 75% of all urethane produced worldwide are made by four major industries. And the reason why is these are what the industries that use lots of foams. So automotive, furniture and bedding, appliances, and construction. 50% of all polyurethanes are flexible foams, and 60% of all flexible foams, or 30% overall, are for cushioning and padding, like in your car seat or your furniture, or bedding. So, uh, when it comes to 25% of all flexible foams, you're looking at automotive upholstery, 60% is furniture. Then the rest of the uh, things are semi-rigid and rigid. Those are used in insulation, um, both in commercial, industrial, and residential buildings. So if you have a new build for, for uh, your own home, uh, often to, uh, the way to go, and this is you know, my personal feeling, is to have the spray foam uh, for insulation before all of your drywall goes up because uh, if you have a good spray foam, it adheres to your studs and your, uh, and your, uh, your backing, and it, it, it insulates extremely well. 
high R value. So be way better than you know the uh, fiberglass stuff that you have to staple in and you spend the rest of your life itching as a result. So um, that for a new, but this is typically not something you retrofit very often. Uh, it, not a lot of people want to rip out all their drywall so that they can spray all their studs with foam. Uh, there are foams that are present, present in the tires of forklifts. Uh, in other words, puncture and cut resistant tires. If you're driving a forklift with, say, a couple of tons on the front of it and you, get a, and you run over a nail, you don't want that, that tire to blow. It will cause bodily harm and loss of inventory. So that's why, uh, that's how they make um, puncture resistant tires. Integral skin and semi-rigid foams are often used for uh, automotive steering wheel covers, cycles and motorcycle seats and bumpers. Um, I myself have leather seats and a leather wrapped steering wheel, but you peasants might indeed have something that's faux leather or naga hide, uh, and that is a integral skin or semi-rigid polyurethane foam made to look like leather to make you feel better about your ride. So um, I know I've got leather, it's okay, I don't judge you any differently. Uh, Ski boats are often made from reaction injection molding, so a mixture is injected into a mold under pressure, and that's allowed to react and expand in, in place until it comes in contact with a mold. And what you get is a foamed material that has a nice outer smooth surface. So it's lighter weight, but it has a nice outer smooth surface. Elastomers themselves, uh, well, polyurethane elastomers are rubber-like because they're elastomers. Uh, they have very high resistance to abrasion, uh, UV radiation, and high impact. Um, very high flexural modulus. Uh, you can get elongation, uh, it's a little bit lower, so about 70%, uh, and fairly good impact properties. They can be produced by all different isocyanate systems, so compression molding, reaction injection molding, or thermoplastic processes, uh, depending on the type that you have. These are often used for drive belts, encapsulation of electri electrical components, cable fittings, uh, printing roller covers, uh, they're nice and flexible, uh, flexible molds for concrete, outdoor panels uh, and fenders by reaction injection molding, an athletic running track. The nice springy track uh, is a polyurethane elastomer. Polyurethanes are also used in paints as coatings, as I've also mentioned. So one step, two step, and moisture cured uh, varieties. Uh, these are very good high hardness and flexibility. Uh, they do have low temperature or room temperature curing, and they adhere really well to surfaces. Uh, they're good resistance to chemical attack, weathering, and degradation. Uh, they're often used in airplanes or automotive coatings, especially and um, consumer wood finishes. They are very good for corrosion protection of metals. Uh, they can seal and coat concrete floors and bridges, and they're also good for textile coatings, paper coatings, and leather coatings. So they're used extensively throughout most areas where coatings are used. Um, adhesives made from polyurethanes are usually based on aqueous dispersions. They're solvent-free. They're 100% solids, and this is a big growth area for polyurethanes. Um, these reactive adhes adhesives can be used for structural bonding of plastics and automotive body panels, and this is really advantageous due to the absence of solvents. So no VOCs are created, but you get a good bond anyway. So this concludes our polyurethane lectures. Please uh, take your quiz on the second half uh, video and pr uh, then proceed to silicones after this.